the recording. Good evening, everyone. This is Scott Anderson with AgriBest Feeds, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar here this evening. We're talking about sea minerals for soil health, and it's been very interesting to me over the past week. There's been a number of articles that have come across my desk on different things on soil health. Tonight, we're going to be focusing on uh, cropland, farming, uh, pasture land, uh, different ways that we can utilize these sea minerals. But one of the uh, articles that came across my desk this week was out of the Progressive Cattlemen, and it was six reflections from the National Conference on Grazing Land. And as you kind of skim down through that, uh, the number one was focus on soil health. And uh, Kendra Gordon says, typically you hear about soil health in an agronomy conference, but grazing managers also know it's the foundation for good range and pasture. Soil health is priceless. And so that's one of the things that we're going to be visiting about, both on the rangeland and also for uh, farming for crops and whatnot. So this evening we ha are very privileged to have Aaron Ellison from uh, Redmond. He has been working with a number of different trials around the country utilizing the sea minerals and he's going to give us a little bit of a background on uh, utilizing sea minerals for soil health and then uh, kind of the background on on the value of it and then look at a couple of these trials and then we'll open it up for question and answers as we get along so uh, with that I'm going to uh, turn this over to Aaron and I'll make you the presenter. So Aaron, you can go ahead and uh, take over. Thank you, Scott. Welcome everybody, pleasure to be with you again. Uh, nice warm sunny day out here in Utah. I think spring's finally coming. Um, this picture you're looking at though was taken last October. We had a uh, Somebody from back east out here taking a bunch of pictures and doing up some articles with the with the ads some dealers were doing back east and so we enjoy some of these pictures they took. But uh, yeah, like Scott said tonight, we'll talk a little bit about oh, in case anybody's new to it, uh, a little bit about the Redmond products and kind of what makes them so unique and special, and uh, a little bit about how they work and how we've applied it, you know, in the field and livestock and pastures and, you know, all kinds of things. And so uh, just by way of introduction here, <clears throat> get you acquainted with Redmond and our operation a little bit. Here's another shot. Again, this is an October picture last, last fall. We're about a mile high here in the little valley of Redmond, Utah. And just a few miles north of town between these mountain ranges is where we have this operation where this big uh, oh, kind of a stegosaurus type of a backbone of this salt layer that's way down deep in the earth kind of pushed up back in the day whenever the earth was making its movements and everything and and happens to be right underneath that big rib backbone is where we're sitting here this picture you're looking at and those that warehouse there is where we load all your trucks from and um, the bolt piles out there are industrial uses for that stuff. And uh, just, just a, another shot here from the other side. So now you're looking east. The first picture was looking west. This is looking east. And in the foreground, you'll see some piles of the freshly excavated uh, Montmorillonite clay, our Redmond conditioner, also called. Uh, we excavate that out. It's kind of right behind where we're looking from this view, uh, one of the main pits that we pull that out of. And we put it out on that pad to dry and before we take it to mill it to size. So just a, a back shot of, of the same place. <clears throat> just a little bit north of those pictures we were just looking at, uh, about a mile north, this is one of the main entrances that we've been taking the salt out of for, you know, quite a few years. And you can see the whole, whole road leading down into it. This, this picture I like because it gives you a little bit of an idea. You can see 
the white on the walls there, you can see about how little overburden there is until you start getting down into the salt. And so down there we have about, oh, we're probably around four miles total of underground tunnels that we mine out. And our deepest point is probably maybe 400 feet at this point. And so in this picture you can kind of see uh, what these mine tunnels look like. We take them, the average ones are about 40 or 60 feet wide and tall and and the, the veins of the salt run up and down from the way that was laid in and so it's very self-supportive. We don't have to reinforce and, and it's been many years this way. So you got a picture there of the drill rig. When we're aimed in a direction we drill holes with that big rig 17 feet deep a lot of holes in the face of that thing, and that's where we <clears throat> that's where we pack the explosive and bring that down, the ammonium nitrate, and then haul it out in those big Tonka trucks. <clears throat> uh, kind of a fun picture on the old history. When the Bouchard brothers opened this mine up, they, you know, of course, put those big pieces and started just hauling them around to the locals and started selling it that way, and it's gone from there to developed today into <clears throat> many facets. You know, the food grade is a big one. These pictures here, all the most of you I'm sure are familiar with the salt shakers, the seasoned salts and the the same clay deposit. Some we you know we get that Redmond clay out of just like the Redmond conditioner. Uh, we also in case any of you are new to Redmond, obviously we have the the rocks on top of that, you'll see we go into the wildlife and the horse markets with, and uh, agriculture, of course, industrial. So we've served, we've made a lot of skews out of a couple of main uh, raw natural products. And so that's just a quick overview of, of uh, Redmond as a company today. So to get into to the uh, the other parts we're here to talk about tonight. Um, if any of you haven't seen this book, Sea Energy Agriculture, it's a good little read, especially tonight when we're talking about how we've applied this in the soils. We've, we've had a lot more experience using this stuff with livestock and had great results, as many of you are, I'm sure could talk about. But if you haven't read this little book, it's an easy read, and Dr. Murray was quite ahead of his time. Uh, you can see from his clothing style there that he's back in the mid-century, the last century, and he did a lot of work with uh, with these sea minerals. Medical doctor and a researcher, and he kind of caught on that, uh, you know, with all of his, his love for the sea, did a lot of work on sea animals, and he learned after World War II that... Uh, testing the sea all over the world, uh, they consistently found in most places uh, the certain breakdown of these minerals in certain quantities. And you know, all, all 90 minerals on the elements on the periodic table were, were present in this sea. And as he studied and was fascinated with human diseases and why heart disease and things like that were, were getting more and more popular or increasing, you know, uh, started looking to the sea and these animals when he'd autopsy them and look at them he was finding that they didn't age like we do on earth they didn't have the heart diseases and they didn't have clogged arteries and all of these sea species seemed to it would be a lot healthier <clears throat> he didn't find cancers in these animals and one of the statements out of this book there that you're reading there, uh, he says that these these sea minerals are crystalloid state, and and as probably most of you know, even in modern medicine, you go in and get these IVs in the hospital and things, and they tend to use crystalline or colloidal because they'll they're so much more utilizable. And as as Dr. Murray taught clear back then. You know, these will diffuse through the membranes of animals and plants like they're supposed to. And so when you take <clears throat> when you take the minerals that we have here at Redmond in their unrefined nature, just the way 
and, and I guess I should answer the obvious, I suppose, why, why are these even called sea minerals? All of these mineral deposits, especially the ones that are salt, like our salt, were, were a sea at one time or another. Today you have modern sea salt you can buy at the health food store, and most of that is off of the modern ocean, and it's evaporated just to get down to the sea solids. And uh, this particular operation here happens to be an ancient sea. That's why they're still classified. So any salt really is sea salt, but they're all left behind. But one of the things that's unique about these deposits here in Redmond, for some reason, and the geologists tend to think that it's because of this, this clay on top that we showed you a picture of, that it, its origin is volcanic ash. And they theorize that, that when it fell into that seawater, it has protected the minerals and kept them from leaching out. And so we don't have a, a white or a gray salt mine like they do in Kansas or New Mexico or you know, any of these other ones. Uh, the mineral content is so much richer, like it was in the in the sea and is in the sea. And there's only two or three places in the world that it seems to be that we know of anyway, where there's where there's that mineralized of the salt being mined. And so uh, that's what makes it so unique. Uh, the regular salt that we deal with, the salt that you put into whether it's on the table or into your livestock blocks or bags or feeds. Is sodium chloride. Our neighbor up here, in, or you know, our neighboring Salt Lake salt up here, that's what they do. Any of you have flown in here, they they take those ponds and they they precipitate off and they do whatever they do up there to get these other minerals out of it. And the sodium chloride that's left over is what has been handed to us and marketed to us as salt. And so that's what the world knows as salt. That's what the research has been done with. And when you do that to salt, it changes things. That's also what kind of makes it a harsh compound. And when the medical professionals talk to people about, to some of us, about getting off of salt or whatever, it's bad for your heart or, for your, you know, whatever, um, it, it does change things when you refine it down to that. So with these minerals all left intact and in balance and proportion, are the words that Maynard Murray uses that I really like, when it's in an actual balance and proportion, then things work different. And and like he says here, you don't have the water buildup issues, no retaining water, like in a, a pregnant cow uh, that gets under edema because, you know, that's why they don't feed dry cow salt in rations for that reason. Those who understand these products, I've been told several times by different nutritionists that Redmond salt is the one salt that you can feed a gestating cow and not have utter edema because the body biology knows what to do with this stuff because it's natural and in proper balance. So with that little bit of an explanation, uh, Dr. Murray also told us that uh, if you take a quantitative analysis of practically any warm-blooded creature, not just a human, but you find very similar profiles, mineral profiles, as you do in the, in the seawater. And so he's even done experiments where he's injected seawater into, you know, lab mice and things like that, and you know, we can talk about that some other time. But it's interesting how some of that works. So with that thought, um, Dr. Berger from Illinois <clears throat> published his paper in the salt with the Salt Institute is where we took this from, and they verified what Dr. Murray was saying. So in the human blood, if you take everything out and just look at the mineral profile alone, <clears throat> you have sodium being the chief cation in your blood. And we all, I mean, you think about that, it makes sense. That's the first thing that you get an IV for as soon as you are admitted to the hospital for any procedure is the uh, salt water. <clears throat> so with that, the other remaining seven or whatever percent of the mineral profile in the blood is all the other all the other micro and macro elements. And so the quiz question for the day is if any of you happen to be new enough to the products, 
when we're talking about Redmond Salt, what is the profile? What is the makeup? And you'll find on average that it's just about like this. About 90, in the low 90s percent of uh, the salt and the 7-ish percent of all the other trace minerals. So very, very similar. So with these kind of things, it, it begins to make sense that we see some of the results that we do. So we'll start into being that this is a soil oriented webinar. We'll not talk too much about the livestock today. But I'm going to present to you four different trials. AgriBest uh, was great and helped us with a couple of these. Um, I did one. So we're going to look at one that we did in 2010 and 11 in Idaho. We'll look at one that the two of them that AgriBest helped with in, uh, or that performed in Montana and Nebraska just this last summer, 2012. And then I was able to get good data off of one in Oklahoma uh, this past summer of 2012, too. So we'll, we'll take a look at these and just kind of show you what we have seen. Now, we're, we've got a lot more things we want to measure. Uh, Dr. Abe Schaefer was talking to me the other day, and he's, he's got a couple of things that are pretty cool I think we'll look at. And somehow that we can measure a little bit more of what's actually going on in the soil. The results we're going to look at today are just the, the evidence that has come off the field. So as a as a farmer, I'm interested in the things that the data gathered here, and it's neat to see. And I think by the time we're done, you know, I think we're seeing some pretty nice trends. Um, the other thing before I get too too far into these, <clears throat> well, and we can talk about it at the end too. But when we're talking about these these minerals, these sea minerals, their role, I get this, I get asked this question all the time. You know, basically, what am I going to expect? Can I replace everything else with this? Can, do I have to use, you know, whatever anymore? And I don't know all the answers to that. What we do know, you know, there's there's just so many soils and types and whatever you're growing, and there's just so much to involved in answering a question like that. But the role of these minerals, whether it's in the rumen of a cow or the rumen of the plant, which is the soil. Um, the, the role of these minerals, as near as we've studied and can tell and have learned and researched and whatever else, is that minerals drive all of the microbial activity in the body or in the soil. Um, it gives these microbes something to, to help with their own nutrition, something to transport to the plant. Microbes in the soil and everything I've understood, their their role is to, to take things back and forth to the plant because the plant won't obviously touch everything that it needs to have in the soil. The microbes are a huge part of that. So I'm I'm not surprised the more that science uncovers that the thing Scott showed you at first from the grazing conference, you know, more and more people are tuning into what what's really going on in the soil. So these minerals are just a catalyst to help that. So will will the addition of Redmond C minerals replace nitrogen? I'm not going to say that it will. I you know to me I would probably suggest look at this more like um, almost like a vitamin mineral type of a supplement. I mean it'll make things happen when microbes are healthier. We do know that microbes lend a lot to the health of the soil or the rumen or the cow. Um, you can have more calcium, for example, being utilized and you're actually feeding an animal because of microbial activity, things like that. So just bear that in mind, uh, but hopefully you'll enjoy looking at some of these results that we've seen. So to start with, we'll start with the Idaho trial I did. This, this guy up there is a, a grazing dairy. In fact, I'll jump ahead a picture too. Here's a, here's a picture of you know, part of his place. He's got a herd of Holstein cows, and he grazes. Of course, in the winter, there's nothing to graze in Idaho and Utah. Um, he takes the milk that he produces and runs it through his own creamery. And 
I can't remember. Yeah, that's the only picture I have of that. Runs it through his own creamery where they, now he pasteurizes his, but they fill the milk, they make chocolate milk, they make ice cream. And this is just in a small town in Idaho, and they do really, really well with it. He sells his butter and things like that to, you know, restaurants and all the way from Pocatello and Idaho Falls to Boise, Idaho. And so this is this is what this guy does with these cows. <clears throat> uh, he'll he'll use he takes a pretty biological approach, so he hasn't used commercial fertilizers for years, probably forever. So he will use uh, biological things, you know, the manure from the field, from the corrals, and he's used fish products before, things like that. But So with that in mind, on his place, what we did, this is kind of the first one I, I ever put together and tried. We, we left one, <clears throat> one area of uh, control area, just so we had something to compare to. We didn't put anything on it. And then as you can see there, we took a combination of between the, the bread and the salt conditioner and different application rates on these treatments. Uh, remember, in case I forget to mention it later, that in 2011, the same area has got the same treatment, but no conditioner got applied that year. So we got shorted a little bit on that, of which he regrets. He thinks there's a lot more that it has to offer, but uh, we'll, we'll get going with these pictures. and going to show you what we found. This first slide, uh, the BRICS reading, in case any of you haven't heard of that, BRICS is a French guy's name, a doctor that came up with, basically you take a refractometer, put plant juice on the lens of it, when you hold it up to sunlight and look into it like a little monocular or a telescope, it will just show you a level of the dissolved, people like to say sugars, but it's not just sugars, but I guess in a plant it probably is mostly. Um, and it'll show you a scale that gives you a reading, and the higher the reading, the more dissolved stuff or nutrition is in the plant. So that means the more value it has to offer, you know, whatever you're going to feed it to. So when we take the BRICS readings, and I've seen this over and over again, it's not just this place. You know, it's almost like the more sea minerals we put on, the higher the brick reading we can get. And a lot of people really hang their hat on that. Um, I probably don't hang it on as much as some people do because that can really change. You know, at Redmond, we have a farm, and, and I take the readings out there. We also have a grazing dairy. I kind of monitor those hay fields and pastures. And, you know, when we were a little bit water-stressed this last summer, Toward the end of summer, I took some readings, and we normally have about a 12 reading for bricks, and I was I was coming up with some 25 and 6 readings on stress hay. So I, it's it's a tool, and it's a good tool. You just you take it often enough that you get familiar with your fields, and, and you can do it across these treatment groups and find out where there's more stuff in your plant. And that's that's what this is showing, and it's pretty repeatable. We also uh, once we cut and bailed the hay, we hayed this this alfalfa grass polyculture field is what this was that we were analyzing. Several species of pasture grasses and it's irrigated. We also so we just turned in a feed sample, a normal feed sample to the feed lab, and these are the results we got back. So <clears throat> you can see the crude protein contents from blue is 2010, and and then the same treatment again minus the conditioner. Uh, in 2011, you see what happened. So there's there's a, even a better showing the second year after these treatments. What's interesting to me, and we're still learning, but 150 pounds of salt has the highest bricks reading in this stuff we did for two years in a row. But it acts more like the control group in these protein readings. That was interesting. When we get out there, conditioner, where the one year it got conditioner, the second year it didn't. The second year is still sort of benefit, probably some residual from the first year, which is not uncommon. We hear of that. Almost equal to the salt and conditioner combination. But then we get out there at 75 pounds of salt and you have that. So these again, this is just you know, this is this is just raw data. I want you to just kind of go away from here tonight 
hopefully with more questions and, and as you all work at it, maybe you can help us to come up with some more answers. But just kind of an interesting trend I notice on that. Looking at the fiber, um, <clears throat> just in case any of you uh, don't know that the TDN is on a feed sample represents total digestible nutrients. So obviously the higher that number is, the higher quality the feed. ADF and NDF are acid detergent and neutral detergent fibers. Essentially those are the numbers that we look at when we go to the lab to analyze feed. We begin to in vitro or in the lab digest that feed and the NDF is the total fiber. The ADF is what comes out after the mimicked digestion of the cow. That's what's left over. So the ADF, there's not a whole lot of value left in the ADF. So what this chart is showing us is, again, when you look out there toward the end, when you're looking at anywhere from, you know, 75 pounds of salt and with or without the, the clay to go with it, the bigger the spread between the blue line and the green line, the higher quality feed you have and the higher that green line is. So, you know, out there at 75 pounds of salt, you have you have the best, highest quality feed <clears throat> according to the feed sample. So that's how you how you look at this. In fact, it's interesting that the trend for uh, ADF and NDF, you know, you, you see that dropping with those treatment groups. That's that's a nice picture. I mean that. I couldn't have asked for better, you know. And honestly, when I when I did this up there on that deal in Idaho, I hoped to see something. I did not expect to find what we found here, so I was very pleased with that. Uh, the, the mineral profiles, just again off the feed samples that we sent into the lab, these are the feed pro the mineral profiles that came back. <clears throat> so again, you look at Redmond salt, for example, is about a half of a percent calcium. So on a piece of paper, somebody's going to say, well, that doesn't offer a lot of calcium. So my comment earlier about microbial activity and their health and what they lend to a plant, how is it that we can gain, you know, almost a 50% increase in calcium over the control area with a product that at 75 pounds an acre at half percent calcium, that just math doesn't add up. Somehow the plant shows more calcium than, than the Redmond products delivered. So just interesting stuff to think about. The same thing with magnesium, phosphorus, we didn't see a whole lot of difference. We struggle with phosphorus out here in Idaho and Utah. That seems to be a limiting factor for us. But uh, again, just, just some interesting observations. A few micro elements that that, that lab would analyze for us. Boron has received more and more attention over the last few years. So again, with the amount of boron that's in these Redmond minerals, you wonder how between the control group and these treatment groups out there, again, when you start finding a third more of it in the plants, it's interesting, you know, especially at such a low application rate. So the last slide on this, this one, just curious to see what the sodium content was because, you know, they talk about lower sodium, and especially for dairy hay, they talk about low potassium hay. But interesting that the highest <laughs> sodium readings are in the control group that received no salt or clay. So that, that's interesting to me. But again, you know, what would happen if we did this year after year? We might, I don't know what we would find, but... I'm, I'm convinced with the soil test, too, that we've taken in places that sodium is not building up. And again, at 35 pounds an acre, I mean, that is not a very heavy application. So contrary to what you're going to hear, or what you've already heard when you've talked to your neighbors about throwing this stuff on the field, and they say, you're going to do what? Um, you talk about 75 or 100 pounds. I mean, think about your some one acre corner of something somewhere and you're taking a bag or two of these red minerals and spreading it over that whole thing. It's not a lot of product and, and besides that it's it's trace minerals. It's not just sodium chloride. So that's kind of how that one went. Um, 
And here I'll talk a couple of things about what AgriBest helped us with, and uh, and and certainly if Scott or whoever might be out there that wants to jump in on this, we'll be happy to hear from them too. <clears throat> this gentleman in Nebraska, this is a corn treatment that they did this summer, and from the data we collected and the measurements off of everything, the treatments on this commercial fertilizer, his fertilizer program was used all over everywhere like he usually does. And then in addition to that, he took 200 pounds of our Edmund conditioner on one area, which <clears throat> I didn't include here, but on the, um, the synopsis he gave us, he put that much on because he's got an area, this particular part where he did that test, is probably the poorest part of the farm, if I understand correctly. It's not one of the best anyway. And so I thought we'd put a little bit extra on to, to build that soil somewhat. And then every you know, everywhere else on the normal stuff, then he put the forty pounds of the of the combined product per acre. Then number three was kind of our control area where it just got the fertilizer. So that's kind of the setup for what uh the Agribest boys did on this one last summer. So here's a bit of a well, how the graphs looked. So on that 200 pound on your bushels per acre, you're at about 150 on the on the 200 pounds of the along with the commercial fertilizer on his normal soil. Uh, the the addition of Redmond boosted him another. You know, what does it look like there? 168, 170. You know, another. I can't remember what it actually was, but it's looking like it was another eight or ten bushels with the addition of these minerals. So again, just just an observation, but it looks like the minerals really help the soil microbes do what they do to grow a better plant. The BRICS readings on the bottom right corner, uh, again, not surprising. We like the more redmond we put down, the higher BRICS readings we can get. So that's, that's not a surprise there. Um, before I hit this one, uh, just pipe in, Scott, if you have anything to say or add or if any of these guys are joining us and want to say anything, just just let me let me know. Yeah, Aaron, that's uh, Mike's not on this evening, so um, the one question I had on the on where he had the 200 pounds of conditioner, if he was happy with that, and he said, "Oh yeah, that's because that's a, basically blow sand there," and uh, he was very happy with the, the increase in that area as well. So um, he was very pleased with how, how this trial turned out. Super. Uh, if there's nothing else on his, we'll move into your Montana study. Uh, what Scott and Sammy did up here uh, last summer, this is dry land wheat. And this farmer, um, I protect their names. I don't know if Scott can let you know if he wants to share who these guys are or not, but I you know, I hate to hate to give anybody any undue. If they want it, I'll be happy to share their names, but I also want to protect people, you know, when they're willing to share this data with us like this. Um, but anyway, the treatment here is both sides of these pictures you're gonna see, both sides of these wheat fields, dry land wheat received the urea. 4600 at 85 pounds an acre. So the difference will be that one of them received 1152 or MAP monosodium, uh, what the heck is that? Anyway, MAP 1152, we call it. The 50 pounds then of the per acre of the mixed product again, a little heavier on the conditioner than the salt. <clears throat> so this is what this treatment is comparing here. And I will say in fairness, uh, and this is where Scott can correct me, there's a piece of the field, and maybe we'll sh we can show it, there's a piece of the field where I believe ran a little shy of one kind of seed and had to supplement another, but by and large, I think it's a pretty fair trial. So Scott can correct me on anything that I that I mess up here on this one. <clears throat> this This first picture, Kind of in the middle of the picture, you can see that little line that heads up the field. That's that's the line we're talking about. So the right-hand side, yeah, there you go. 
So the right hand side is uh, is which trait was that, Scott? That was the Redmond side, right? I think the right hand side is the Redmond side, and the left hand side is the the uh, control or the you know the 1152. A um, little bit of results that we got from that. Uh, just looking first of all at the cost part of it, just because of the cost of Redmond versus the cost of 1152, which last year uh, was probably pushing $800 a ton, and I and he's using 50 pounds. So 700 plus. Okay, I couldn't remember. It's expensive. I know that. I used a little bit a couple years ago, and I I won't do that again. I don't know that I got anything out of it with our little farm at Redmond. So anyhow. Uh, the revenue, and you'll see, I should, probably should have put the production up a little earlier, but you'll see it in a minute. Um, the Redmond side yielded a little heavier yield and than the, than the uh, 1152 side. So, yeah, so there's your, there's your revenue per acre, your cost per acre, I mean, just, just the way you're reading it, and then the net. So obviously cheaper to put the Redmond down, a little more revenue because of the increased yield. So they took home, what, 40, whatever that is, 40 more dollars excess of that per acre off this trial with that. So I, you know, this guy was pretty happy too. Here's just a charted picture of those same numbers. Um, you know, charts can be deceiving depending on how they're, how they're scaled. Here's a here's a picture again that delineator down the middle, the right side being the Redmond and the left side being the 1152. Again, both sides got some nitrogen. Got that 4600. The reports were that, uh, and here's a little bit more of a eye level shot. It seemed to be every bit as healthy and full, and you know by all appearances. Uh, we didn't miss a beat with it. Um, Aaron, go back to that last slide just for a second. <clears throat> this was taken in July, I believe. And when we went up there, um, Gary is the name of the farmer that uh, took us up there. And he just randomly would grab a, a head from uh, the wheat on the, on the right side, which is your sea mineral side. And he would kind of look for uh, the head on the wheat on the on the left side where the commercial fertilizer was, and it was very interesting that he had to search pretty hard to find um, a, a comparable head on the on the wheat there. So so he was uh, very impressed when uh, we were up there at this point already, and his goal was, you know, if I can. If I can kind of break even on this thing where the sea minerals will produce as well as the commercial fertilizer, well, my cost savings on the on the fertilizer application um, just made him quite a bit of, of money. Uh, but then where it actually outperformed that um, by about 15% uh, bushels per acre, um, uh, he, he was very, very pleased with it. So we're, we're continuing this trial again this year. Uh, we're going to go right back on top of the same exact thing. He's got, you know, as you can see, this is all um, put down with, you know, GPS. He knows exactly where all of these um, plots are. And then he's going to uh, do a larger portion of his farm this next year as a, as a more extended trial. Thank you for that input. There we go. Okay, bushels, test weight, and protein off of that picture you just saw. The uh, the Redmond side yielded four more bushels per acre. Test weight was a little higher in this one. And again, I don't know if that little bit of seed, because of different varieties, might have had some persuasion here. In this case, the protein's a little lower. So this feels a little contrary to what we saw in the grasses and the alfalfa earlier. 
but uh, interesting that there was there was more bushels and test weight. So in this particular year, that all worked in his favor with the pricing and everything, and and so he was definitely happy with the with the economic return that this brought. So there's there's a picture of the you know, of the results that way. And again, just charting those numbers uh, probably looks better in the graph before. But. Okay, and then harvest time. And Scott, going through these, I, I think there's one or two more pictures. So if there's anything else you have to say about it, jump in here. More photographs to fit of this. And the last one we'll talk about tonight is uh, the one I did in Oklahoma. This is a this is a cow calf operation down there. Um, not real great pasture in his particular, as you'll see later. Uh, he doesn't have pictures of it, but just from the results we did. So on this, we did kind of a similar fashion to what I did in Idaho, a control area. So we had something to compare it against. 50 pounds of uh, salt conditioner combination, 100 pounds. Uh, number four, I've got a typo there I have since fixed. I forgot to do it before tonight on this one, but it's 50 pounds of the sea minerals and 100 pounds of the conditioner for volcanic ash. So there you go. And then the last area was just the salt alone. So that's what that's what this one will show. So once again, uh, crude protein levels in this particular lab that this guy used, Henry is his name. Um, he his lab measures soluble protein as well as the crude protein. So on this little trial, you're going to see some stuff that to me was quite fascinating. So you look there. In fact, we might come back to it. But this this shows you a little bit more dramatic picture. Again, it's, I know it's how it's scaled, but for the purpose of what we're talking about, um, just look at those protein levels of the different treatment groups. Pretty self-explanatory there. On this on this test, this guy was pretty pleased with the combination uh, product here. One of the things that I'll point out while I'm thinking of it is out here in the West, we tend to probably not need quite as much sea minerals as we do if, you know, west of Mississippi, for example. The more humid the environment, the more organic matter in those soils, the more forgiving it is, the more moisture. Um, everybody out there, we have several, several people whenever I'm out and about traveling back there that. Uh, Several fertilizer companies that have started using Redmond in their stuff. I mean, they'll routinely use 100 pounds an acre in their recipes. Out here, we're thinking about half that. By the evidence we've gathered so far, seems to give us about what we need here. We're already alkaline out here. The pH is already high. Back east, is low. You know, just things like that. So the pretty interesting. So once again, the actual numbers on the protein content. So when you take you take something in the twelves compared to a nine and a half, you know, that's a pretty significant increase. And with the combination products you get a little bit more, at least in the middle there, than than with just the straight sea minerals or salt. But again, just an observation. Uh, this guy's trying to decide how much he can afford to do this year, but we'll, we'll likely do some more on that one this year again. Try to do the same areas. Uh, calcium, phosphorus, and magnesium. A lot to report here. Didn't see a ton of difference on these across the board. The uh, here's here's the those things charted. That might be a little bit easier way to look at it to spot a difference. Here you actually had the highest calcium number on the control area, so that one's a little bit interesting compared to the others that we've done. But in this one, unlike my Idaho one, we seem to have a little more phosphorus and in some cases magnesium. So just an interesting picture there to report. And then again, remember my explanation on the ADF, the, the fibers, and then the total digestible nutrients, the TDN there. This slide excites me too. 
you have a higher relative feed value whenever that TDN number is higher. So from a control of 52.9 to somewhere in that combination of products of sea minerals, uh, 56, 57, you know, that is a significant increase in TDN. That feed is definitely better, as you'll see here uh, in the next slide. Before we, before we go to that, again, just remember the, the bigger the spread, the lower the, the red and blue lines and the higher the green line, and then the bigger that spread, the more desirable it is. It remembers how to look at this chart. So this is obviously when he measured this, this is, I can tell just by looking at this, this is a little bit ranker, probably a little more mature by the time he, he got it off, where the NDF numbers are so high, higher than the TDN even, which makes this a low feed value item, as you'll see. But still, over the control group, a little less NDF, a little more TDN, a little less ADF. So certainly had some improvements here. This slide reveals a fair bit to me, too. That NEL is net energy for lactation. Usually, uh, <clears throat> uh, you'll have net energy for maintenance or gain. You know, depending on what your lab shows, it could have several readings there, but that net energy is what it's talking about. And again, 56 to 58, pretty significant over a control group of 53. In this, in this trial, he, he definitely seemed to, we, seems like we really saw some benefit from adding that, that volcanic ash or that conditioner to it too. Relative feed value, you probably all know for sure what that number means. This is where you, because of that higher TDN, you definitely have more relative feed value. So Henry wants to, um, well, Gene Henry, his last name's Henry. He he was pretty intrigued. If he can afford it, he would like to go with this 50 pounds of salt or sea minerals and 100 pounds of conditioner around to more of his acres is what he'd like to do. He'll see what he can afford this year. But uh, I probably tend to agree with him. That seemed to be somewhere in there. Seemed to be a pretty good combination. So we have we have much more to do with this. Uh, we're still trying to zero in on how much do you use where and when and what types of soils. And <clears throat> I'm sure that you know from the guys that have done this quite a bit that you've heard from in the past, or you could get them on Agribest uh, archives of some of the of the soil deals. We've had a couple of guys on before in the last few years that. Have played with this quite a bit, but uh, they, they those guys have taught me that the more the more biology you have going on in your soil actively, the more of these minerals you can you can utilize too, uh, and it just kind of spirals upward, and you get just a lot healthier healthier soil. So, like I say, this year as we go along, we'll probably take a couple of these ideas they've had and. You know, maybe look at a couple other things, how we can, uh, I know we can take a sample of the soil and send in and have the biology analyzed. <clears throat> it's a little spendier, but we can do that and get a picture of what's going on in there to kind of ex help us understand why we're seeing some of the results that we are. So just, uh, oh, I forgot I had that relative feed value. There's just a little easier way to. To look at the relative feed value there on the chart. Just as a, a, a wrap up slide on this, these four trials that we've done, that we've got data on. <coughs> um, and, and again, this isn't, I didn't run this through statistics, but it just seems like on average we have little incremental increases in all these things protein, the TDN values, the minerals, feed value, the bushels, the bricks. You know, uh, definitely, definitely a similar trend. No matter where we seem to go with this, and we have stories we could tell you until the cows come home about people who've done this. That we just got a few more again the other day of people that are overapplied accidentally, and you know the cows go in and they just really tore after that place where they they got a little too much seed mineral on, and we've got stories of. So the guy who did it and his neighbor thought he was crazy and then they got this torrential rain and 
and it just ran water from his field and the neighbor's field, and he says, oh, great, you're going to kill my crops. And, and you know, his neighbor turned out to have just the best. I mean, <laughs> he, he got a blessing there in the in the rain with the mineral that came across the fence with it. And, <clears throat> you know, we just have tons of that kind of stuff. In fact, these little pictures right here are one guy in Idaho that was raising these turnips for his, he's a grass finisher. Uh, Steve Campbell, he was on one of these webinars a couple of years ago, but he was doing a Maynard Murray test where he was trying to breed disease out of his plants by higher application rates. And so this was three or four hundred pounds an acre of sea minerals. And he was he was when he was telling me the story, he said, Yeah, these turnips were averaging, you know, two inches bigger in diameter and got a lot more yield off. But what I was really looking at, he just goes on like it was nothing. Because what he was really looking at was the disease and, you know, how healthy were they and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, this, this guy is one of those who's done things like this for quite a few years. It has kind of a neat story or two to tell just on his own place there with all of his cattle and, and fields and what he's done both ways, you know, with these minerals. He's just one of those guys that says, man, you guys don't even know what you got. This is just good stuff. So anyway, there's kind of a wrap up uh, on. I think that's the that's that's the last slide I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, so I guess with that, Scott, you can pitch anything else in that you've got, or uh, we can handle some questions, hopefully, or whatever you'd like to do. But that kind of summarizes what I've got for you. All right, thanks a bunch, Aaron. We certainly appreciate your presentation here this evening and taking us through those slides. It's really cool that the all the indicators um, sure look like this is something definitely to consider, uh, both on uh, perhaps decrease some input costs and increase on the production side. Uh, one of the things I just wanted to, sh to touch base with and show real quickly here is that um, Sammy Higgs, who is working for with AgriBest and let's see, I've got to switch presenters here for a second, I think. Uh-oh. I think maybe I froze up here. Oh, no, I, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay. Um, okay. There we go. Okay, Sammy uh, Higgs has developed this uh, C results uh, research data sheet, and for we'd, we'd really like to do a lot more trials all around our our area that Agribest works with, and and I'm sure with Aaron um, and Redmond wherever they are, but basically looking at different soil types and crops and irrigated or dry land all the different things and trying to gain uh, more knowledge and more indicators as we look through through this. So uh, you can connect with AgriBest to, to do a trial and we love to do trials that are just kind of side by side where you've got the same exact uh, environment. Where we're able to get these BRICS tests done where not necessarily comparative across the, you know, across the country or whatnot but across the same field at the same time of day, uh, we can get some good comparisons. And then uh, looking at some of the results, um, you know, how, how did they compare? And then on the back side or on the second sheet, there's, um, you know, additional place for, for writing things down. So uh, that's something that if you are at all interested in doing a trial on your own uh, place, uh, you can give us a call and we will be more than happy to connect with you on that. And I'm going to go one other place here real quick. And this is where you would be able to uh, go to agribestfeeds.com. This is our website. If you have any questions, you can connect with the dealer who invited you onto this uh, webinar or you can call us at our world headquarters at 866-601-6646. A lot of good information on this website as far as 
uh, cattle, horses, um, and over on the products, if you go down to Redmond Natural uh, products, there's a whole bunch of information down here on, for once again, livestock, and even on the real salt soil application, and some videos and things on there. So um, check that out when you get a chance. As you look at resources under archived webinars, you can go back and catch some of the past recorded webinars that we've had on sea minerals with soil health. Here, just click on those and it'll take you through the system of getting you lined up for that. So with that, I'm gonna uh, turn it over here. Uh, Dr. Abe Schaefer is with us. Um, he is our nutritionist on our, on our livestock side, but he's very, very interested in this whole sea minerals for soil health uh, concept, and he's got a lot of interesting thoughts and comments so, Dr. Schaefer, I'm going to unmute your uh, telephone there. Are you on the line with us here this evening? I sure am. Can you hear me? All right. <coughs> Just so, to point out a couple of things. Serenaded music out there in the background. That's cool. And we got some piano practice going on. You're right. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Good. Um Otherwise, I could always cut the music practice. But um, uh, a couple of things to comment on that uh, Aaron mentioned is, uh, one, um, the the Brex test is a really good one uh, to kind of get a sense of uh, plant vitality. We'll, we'll put it that way. Uh, yes, it measures sugars, but it measures total solid, really. And uh, yes, it was first developed for sugars actually in the brewing industry, but uh, uh, it really measures total solids in a solution. And so uh, anytime that you've got soluble solids, uh, maybe that's uh, oxy an oxymoron, but uh, solids that are soluble, um, sugar and soda pop is a soluble solid. But... Um, the Brooks test measures how much nutrients is in suspension, and that's really the nutrients that are uh, most readily available to an animal or uh, anyone who anything or anyone who consumes that plant. Uh, so that's a good way to. And, and then, as Aaron showed, the TDN numbers and the uh, nutrient analysis on those feeds certainly showed that. So that's a, a good method to get a sense of uh, what the nutrient quality of your uh, forages are you know, on a fresh basis. And a bit of a caveat with that is uh, it's important to pick a consistent time during the day uh, when you're going to do that because uh, if you're making a comparison like with applying uh, redmond sea minerals, uh, because time of day will... And, the amount of sunlight the plant gets during a day will affect the Brooks reading. So just make sure when you're making a comparison, um, you do that on a, consistently um, one day to the next. And so, uh, but I really like what the, it, it's kind of straightforward and very usable. So uh, it's a good thing, to, a good tool to kind of have in your back pocket when you're uh, trying to evaluate some things. So, that, enough said with that, uh, Aaron and I and, and Scott have been also talking about some methods that we could get a handle on soil uh, microbial activity, and uh, we'll, more of that probably be coming down the, coming down the pipe here uh, as, as the growing season here progresses. So uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Schaefer, and we appreciate you being on here this evening. Uh, if anybody has any questions, go ahead and uh, type them into your chat bar there, and we can answer those. Um, don't see any at this point, so I'll keep kind of flipping through a couple of these other pictures and 
Um, if there's any any other questions, go ahead and, and type in the chat bar. Uh, I see Marion Rhodes down in uh, Nebraska has your hand raised. Uh, so Marion, if you've got a question there, uh, go ahead and type it in um, on the chat bar. Okay, I've got one that's... Um, okay. Any other, any questions here? I guess I had one question for you, Aaron, on the pasture land in Oklahoma. Was that just dry land pasture? Yes, uh, relying on whatever moisture they can get down there from the sky. Okay, and uh, tell us a little bit about uh, application, how the different application um, uh, ways to, to apply the sea mineral and um, uh, on different different types of operation. Oh, good question. Yeah, thanks for reminding me for that. Um, people like to, I mean, it can be done either uh, dry right onto the soil directly. It can be done foliarly, foliar spraying. Some people prefer to do that. Um, I was asked one the other day, and I need to have a little help with it. I know that in, well, in Gary's case, Scott, I think uh, he actually put his down with the air seeder when he seeded. So that's one application that we've we've heard of that can happen that way. I would I would think it could totally make sense to uh, like the little drill we have at the farm is just a little grain drill. You know, I'll put my three pounds per acre of alfalfa or whatever and with my grass is I'll put that in that little front box. Sometimes I, I would think that that could be used pretty good too for the same thing where you're putting down these low levels. Um, you know, one of the things we've done at Redmond is when we did get a little fertilizer or our manure piles, when we go to spread those out from the cows all winter, uh, sometimes I'll just take these minerals and put it right on that. I mean, it's not very scientific. But kind of people have done about whatever they have to 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 get this stuff out there. I've I used a little gypsum one time for a little bit of uh, benefits it has for some soil, our soil here at Redmond that we needed. And I just I just dribbled the sea minerals. I made I had the truck dump it out in a windrow, <clears throat> and I just dumped these sea minerals with the loader bucket right along the top. And then starting at the end, as I scooped up and took it out to spread it with one of those little flipper you know, ones you pull behind your pickup or tractor. I've done it that way. You know, guys have done it about whichever way uh, you can think of. If you choose to do it foliar, the clay doesn't work too good for that. There's there's just too much stuff in it. What you would do if you choose to do it that way, and this will work for this, the salt or the sea minerals too, though, the guys who do a lot of this will take and mix their product in a tank of some kind, probably not your spray tank yet, because most of these, these smaller nozzles, uh, the little diaphragms and things, you, there's going to still be, even the seed minerals, there's going to be a little bit of fallout that you don't want to damage any of your parts or plug a nozzle or something, and so they'll mix it up in a different tank, let it sit 24 hours, then take the liquid off the top, and you pretty have pretty much have most of the nutrients you're looking for. And if you fold your feed, you're only going to talk about using three or four pounds per acre of sea minerals uh, where you're spraying it. And you want to get your foliage coming on a little bit, like if you spray hay field, for example, after each cutting. Uh, you don't want to wait until you damage your field driving in it, but you also don't want to just spray the stubble. If you can get the foliage coming on a little bit, that that's better. But that three or four pounds an acre, you're not going to overwhelm the plants where you're putting it directly on those little open stomatas to suck it in. Uh, with the dry applications, you've seen some of the rates we've played with. You just about can't overdo it with dry applications. Not cost effective, but so those are those are the ways that most people have chosen to do this. Just kind of take a look at your equipment and what you have to work with, and kind of get creative if you have to. All right, thanks a lot, Aaron. And I don't see any questions coming in here. This evening, so I think 
in respect to everybody's time, we're going to thank you so much for um, your your time and effort here this evening, uh, Aaron. And we'll go ahead and and close the webinar off at this point. Thanks a bunch for um, everyone's attendance and connection here this evening. And thanks especially to Dr. Schaefer for his comments and Aaron for your presentation. I hope that everybody has a great night and we'll talk to you later. Goodbye.